I want to start off talking about the state of North Carolina schools when it comes to the coronavirus. We've seen parents who are protesting for their kids to get back into school. We've seen teachers who don't want to go back, some teachers who do want to go back. You've got some students who are afraid, some parents who just refuse to think about at this point letting their kids back in the classroom. What sort of metrics would you use on a district by district basis to determine whether it was safe or not to go back in? I don't think it's just metrics. Um, I started out saying if under 5% of the tests were positive because that's what I had read on the CDC. Uh, my understanding though is it's changed and some people say it's, it's 3%, I, I'm not sure. But to me it can't just be metrics, it has to be, has the General Assembly uh, given the funding so that it's safe in classrooms. I um, mean that's not just P PPE, that's extra personnel, that's cleaning stations, um, teachers are removing everything from their classroom because you can't have anything soft. Um, there's just a long list of things that need to be done. I think what I would have recommended was by now a timeline of here are the things that need to be done. If you can check these off, then you're probably ready to go back. But I haven't seen anything, um, I haven't seen any plan from the Department of Public Instruction. I haven't seen any um, kind of blueprint of if this, then that. Um, and I think it's all been put on the districts, which uh, can be difficult, particularly when they don't feel funded. So it's sort of like, you know, well, we'll follow CDC guidelines, but there really aren't the guidelines there for our local school districts from a state level. Is that, that what you mean? Yeah, but also the choices that have to be made, the plans that have to be done. For instance, when we uh, found out in March that students weren't coming back, um, I was in an elementary school and the principal said, we're not coming back Monday. And literally a kindergartner right beside me just sneezed you know, and mucus went everywhere. And I was like, that's why we're not in, that's why we gotta leave. Um, elementary schools in particular need lots of things in place. Uh, when the children come back, it's not gonna be like you're coming in where you left off, right? So we're gonna need new routines. We're gonna need ways that we're gonna move through the hall. We're gonna need to know where we go when it's time to eat lunch. We're gonna need to know for teachers, they can't hand papers and get them back. They can't interact. I just think there's a lot of details that haven't been nailed down. I know in Wake County, the principals have written a letter with a lot of these things saying, can we have a really detailed plan so that when we go in, we know they're safe beyond the metrics. Should there be an option for teachers who are not comfortable, who have a pre-existing condition above the age of 50 or so, who just doesn't feel comfortable to be back in the classroom, should they have the option to stay home and teach? There, yes, we have to do that. Um, I think, you know, finding the president was positive today just reiterates that you don't know when it's going to pop up and who's going to get it. And if you're over 50, and I think they say over 60 something, um, you know, you're at risk. Not to mention if you're obese, if you have heart disease, you know, if you have COPD, et cetera. So we have got to find a way for teachers to teach virtually. But that's part of the plan I'm talking about. Where's the plan for those who can't? How are they going to do that virtually? How are we going to use teachers? How are we going to use personnel? Um, someone on a school board in Charlotte was telling me that it's all the personnel issues that are the most complicated. You know, if someone is pregnant, does that make them at risk? It, it's not written anywhere. Um, just a lot of things hammered out. And it would be nice to have some direction at the state level. Is this one of the first things you would tackle if you were to win this seat? Absolutely, I'm kind of tackling it now, but it's hard to know where we're gonna be, you know, in January. But I can't believe that it's gonna be gone. And so in my mind, the first thing you do is, is in project management is have the different scenarios, you know, and what are we gonna do in each of these scenarios? And also demand funding from the General Assembly. The state board asked for 500 million and barely got half of that for safety precautions. Um, I know everyone wants the economy going back and so they feel like schools have to be open. If that's true, then fund it, invest in them so that we can do this properly. Speaking of funding, it comes up every year when it's time to, for, for the uh, General Assembly to get together and figure out the budget, hammer it out for um, our schools. How do you balance funding and achievement? Yeah, so I started teaching in 1987 and taught to 2001. Um, in the 80s and 90s, we were the only Southern high poverty state that our achievement was above national norms 
and we, were, we closed the achievement gap more than any other state in the country. And it was because we had sustained investment. We need to talk about investing in our schools, not just funding them, right? If we don't invest in tomorrow, and what we're doing is we're letting our schools crumble. We need a bond. Physically, they're crumbling. Um, teachers are leaving because one, the pandemic's making them nervous, but also you know, they're spending money out of their pocket. They're having two and three jobs. Um, I've been told teachers who have their children on free and reduced lunch. Uh, we, there's so much we need to do to invest in our schools. And, and the first thing is the bond, I think, as well as teacher salary. When you have uh, a competitive wage, you're gonna get a lot of people who wanna be teachers, then you're gonna get high crop, right? Some of the best teachers. In 1989, when I started, there was a surplus when I started at Guilford County. Um, I had a master's degree, two years experience, and there were no jobs. We can't imagine that now, right? I think there were 1,600 jobs across the state after day 40 last year. Um, so when we invest, we get really great people, interested young people. Um, I also know that when they step on a college campus, uh, if they're going into chemistry or they can teach chemistry, um, if they choose education, they're only gonna make about 75% of what they would have made. So not even necessarily the salary as much as making it competitive against other professionals. Um, but if we do that, we're going to have great teachers to choose from, and then our students are going to get better instruction. One of the things that we knew, but we're really understanding better now, is the lack of broadband across the state. We're a very, very rural state. Mm -hmm. And now that so many kids are learning from home, right. um, we're, we're finding there's some inequities out there. Right. How do you fix that? So we have to change the law, we have to make it a utility so that everyone can have access to it, and we have to fund it you know, so that it's across the state. I tell people, if we can put a missile across the world within three feet, certainly we can put broadband across North Carolina. And it's not just necessarily for learning at home. Um, we all need it. I mean, we need internet now. So if you want to communicate with your teacher via email, uh, if you need to do research, people aren't using the Britannica, you know, encyclopedias anymore, it's just even for research, um, for, you know, finding maps, et cetera. So we need to move our state progressively towards having broadband for everyone and high-speed internet. Do you think the criteria for charter schools is working or should it be changed? Uh, by what, what criteria are you talking about? What, the type of criteria that is required to open one and for you to remain open. So... Two separate things. Right. So... The, my understanding is they don't have to off, offer transportation or lunch. Uh, when you don't do that, you're cutting out a group of people who, who can't get there, right? Th my understanding is the criteria is, though, if they ask for it, then they have to provide it. But that's a lot of thinking for people to do to figure out how to go to charter school. So, yes, I think they need to be more equitable and from the get-go provide uh, funding for transportation and for lunch. I'm more concerned about the cap. You know, we have, um, we started with 100. Uh, now we're well over 200 when we lifted the cap. Um, and it's exploding. And that is money that is causing dual systems. Administration and charters, administration and districts. The money comes straight from the districts, not from the state. So a charter school shows up at Wake County and says, I need my money, um, which can be daunting. And then we know it's exacerbating segregation because we're having, we have charter schools that are black in black neighborhoods and charter schools that are white in white areas. Um, and we know that integrating our students is what's best. Put you on the spot here. What has Mark Johnson done right and what has he done wrong? Uh, I'll start with wrong. <laughs> um, you know, my understanding from what I've seen is he's not willing to be coached He's not willing to compromise. Um, he's not working well with the state board. I mean, it started out with a lawsuit. Uh, there's been fights and tantrums. When I'm listening now, because of COVID, I can't attend, but I'm listening online and they're fighting. Um, that's not how we do things for our students. So I would say dispositionally, um, he struggles to be the kind of leader we need. I also don't think he has the knowledge base. I mean, he taught for two years Teach for America, which does not mean you have a degree in education. It just means that after school and political science, he took a, you know, a job, kind of like the Peace Corps. Um, so I don't think he has the knowledge base either. And those things don't, don't go well. Um, what he's done right, and I struggle with that because it's hard for me to think of things he's done right. Um, and I'm sure he you know, has good intentions. Um, 
He blew up the one department that worked with low-performing schools. That's not right. Um, he has more power than any superintendent in the past. I don't think that's right either. I think we should have checks and balances. Um, the internal auditor reports to him. I don't think that's right. So I'm really struggling. I guess what I would say is I've met some of the people who work in DPI, and he does have some really great people working for him. He's had a lot that have left. Um, I know David Stegall is one of the uh, deputy superintendents, um, and he seems to be doing a great job. So, you know, he surrounded himself with some good people, which is necessary when you don't have the knowledge or the disposition for the, for the job. What's the difference between you and your competitor? Um, so just today, you know, the endorsements came out from the News Observer, and the one thing is she's about school choice. Um, she's uh, very much about charter schools. I'm more for can we put a pause on it and make sure we do it right. Um, and she's also pro-voucher. And a lot of people don't know the difference, but a voucher means you get $4,200 to take to a private school. Um, and, it, and it comes out of our public school money. And when you take that 4200 my opponent will say, well, it's helping poor children. Um, it isn't, because $4,200 won't get you in to our reputable private schools. Um, there are private schools that are popping up for $4,200 to take that money, and they use a curriculum called ABECA. And in that curriculum, uh, animals and dinosaurs and people all live together. Um, it also says slavery wasn't that bad, but it's a private school, so we have no control. Why I want control is because those are citizens. Those are our future kids, or our, our current kids and future citizens who are going to grow up not knowing science. Um, so I'm really concerned about public dollars going into private schools, and she's not. Um, I'm also really concerned about equity. Equity in ways our curriculum um, doesn't represent all our students. Um, it's very hard for us to recruit teachers of color, and we know that when we recruit teachers of color, our students of color achieve better. It's about 15% for every teacher they have. Um, and I have a passion for public schools. Uh, I was an elementary school teacher for 12 years, then a literacy coach before I got my doctorate and moved into higher ed. Now I'm in schools, like when the little boy sneezed, um, supervising my student teachers and interns. So I have spent my life in public schools, where my opponent has had some time around the world, uh, you know, because she was military, uh, in schools, but she's been McCrory's advisor, she's been Margaret Spelling's advisor, both for a year, and now she's at an online university. I think she's removed from what teachers need and want. And I'm teacher's, teacher's champion, they know that. They know I know what it's like in the classroom and that I'm, I'm there to champion for them and kids. Thanks for doing this. Oh, sure, this is, that's it? That was fun. That's it, thanks Good for evening. spending time with us.